it usually will check automatically and tell you that there are things to be updated as well. And this might be, well, that's looking pretty good. I was going to say it might be a little sluggish being in a VM, but it's not bad. And because I did this install earlier today and I did Tumbleweed, which is the rolling one, and I installed the latest snapshot, uh, apparently it doesn't see any uh, patches that are required. But if they were, they would be right here and I can select them, say accept, and then it would just install them. And that's all there is to it. It's pretty easy. Uh, I probably should have launched one of my older Linuxes because there definitely would be patches because I don't launch them constantly. Um, but this is an install that I did um, when I got home from work. And I the first thing I did was download the latest snapshot of tumbleweed which which as i said is the rolling release and every time there's anything significant change to tumbleweed they update the snapshot um this is the one that has the more bleeding edge technology and leap is the one that has uh proven stable technology yeah. and is more like um the open susa uh, uh, more like super enterprise susa enterprise server it's essentially the free version of susa enterprise um, but it's pretty powerful stuff, uh, you know, besides this in YAST, you have, you know, you can do things to manipulate your hardware, uh, you have all of these system, uh, pieces that you can address, you know, you can partition disks, adjust your network settings. Um, decide what services are started and stopped. Uh, and then here, you know, a new directory server, that would be an LDAP directory, not Active Directory, but LDAP, Active Directory is LDAP compliant. So you could integrate a Linux server into a Windows environment with LDAP, you know, uh, and that's kind of cool. Kerberos is an authentication server um, you can assign host names and IP addresses. Um, that's a tool for configuring, configuring the mail server. Uh, there's the tool for configuring the Samba server. Samba is what makes um, a Linux box look like a Windows server. Um, VNC server. TFTP, if you're not familiar with that, that's Trivial Finance. Uh, file transfer protocol that doesn't cross subnets. It's usually used to do things like update network firmware. Uh, you can establish a connection and and from the uh, from the device and and pull the firmware update off your TF TFTP server. Um, then you have this nifty thing, the security and users, so you can configure your firewall. You can run this to harden your OS. Um, App Armor, as I said, is a tool that allows you to put restrictions on what people can do with certain kinds of software. This is where you add your users and groups. The sudo command in Linux, that means super user do. So you can configure sudo to allow people to do certain administrative commands, but they don't necessarily have to have full access to the system. It, it's kind of cool. Um, and then there's like being able to look at your system logs and and so on. So it's, it, as I said, Yast is one-stop shopping. P there are people that love Yast. I love Yast. Uh, there are people that hate it. I'm not sure why they hate it, but I know people that won't touch Susan with a 10-foot pole because it has Yast. Um, but I, I like it. And I think for somebody who is coming to this from Windows, uh, the fact that it's centralized and, you know, you open up this tool and you can see everything there. And if we were to go into software management, you can always add other management modules. So like what we saw here, this is a relatively small list, 
um, and I don't have Apache installed, but I could add tools to manage Apache and uh, and so on. So um, really useful tool. Uh, so that's kind of my walkthrough of what SUSE Linux looks like and how you're going to get it going. If you don't have disk space enough to install the VM and and install a, um, a full-blown version of SUSE, you could run, I didn't put the link in the page, but you could go to opensuSE.org or and if you need me to send you the link, you know, just tell me. You can download uh, the ISO for a live version and you can put it on um, either a USB stick or a DVD. I would recommend putting on a USB stick if you're going to use a live version. It, it performs a bit better than it does off of a DVD. Uh, you know, optical drives, OS is running off, off optical drives tend to be a little bit on the slow side. Um, now, a couple other things, you know, some of the um, exercises, you know, talk about doing um, things in Windows Server. For many of them, Windows Server isn't required, like updating software in this first week. It talks about doing it with Server 2008. Um, Server 2008 isn't required. You can do it with any version of Windows. It's the same whether it's server or client-based. So uh, don't get hung up on the fact that it says server. There's very few of the exercises that really need to be done on Windows Server. And uh, I will at some point post a, a link uh, to download the, a demo version of um, Windows Server from Microsoft. I also think via the, the CCV software store, you know, I think that you can get Windows Server for free as a student. I can't swear to that. You might want to ask your coordinator. Um, but if you wanted to experiment with Windows Server and look at some of the applications um, for securing Windows Server that are built into Windows, uh, you, you can certainly do that. Uh, there are a couple of tools that are built into Windows Server that are not uh, available in the client, and that makes sense because it's to, specifically to address uh, server issues. So, so the first week, you know, the main thing is to do the lab, and many of you already done your introductions. And then I have a whole bunch of background information because people often have questions about the final project. And I know that's way, it's the last thing we're doing. But the final project is a comprehensive security policy. And, when, and so there's a link um, to all of the SANS templates um, somewhere in Moodle. I don't remember if it's under the first week or not, but it, it, it's there. And, and there's different categories. So there's like uh, software security templates, you know, general templates, uh, networking templates, and so on. And in the comprehensive security policy, it means that you do all of them. Um, it, it's, I've had people think that they only needed to do the acceptable use template. Uh, the acceptable use template you know, the acceptable use policy template is the most basic uh, one that you have to use. Um, you know, no organization should be without uh, an acceptable use template. But, you know, an acceptable use template doesn't address disaster recovery. It doesn't arrest, address backup procedures. It doesn't address... Um, how a security breach might be investigated. Uh, there's a ton of stuff around, you know, that are in a comprehensive security policy. So when you, if you decide to go and look at those templates early on, there's a lot of them. I've selected about half a dozen of them that are listed as quiz, quiz grades. That you're, so you're going to edit the policy and you really do need to edit the policy to reflect the scenario. And the, the scenario, you have three scenarios you can choose from. The, the scenarios are in the, in the first week. One is you could be a, 
a small K-12 uh, school district in northeastern Vermont, you know, say 800 students and a limited budget. And so the decisions that you make around security would be for that would be vastly different from the, the biggest scenario, which is a defense contractor with tens of thousands of employees with government practice, government contracts doing a lot of top secret work. And then the middle of the road one is your, you know, a mid-sized internet web retailer with uh, a couple of hundred or so employees and a couple locations. So, you know, the, the templates are, are good as they are, but they're, they're not one size fits all. So I've had people that, you know, let's say they select a defense contractor, um, they make the security policy, they modify it and make it super tight. If they're the K-12 institution, you know, they loosen it, you know, the, like lock, lock down desktops don't work very well in a K-12 environment because how do you teach the kids how to use the OS if they can't access anything in the OS? On the other hand, kids will make really stupid decisions <laughs> and make your, uh, if they're allowed too much freedom, they can make your system non-functional. So what, what's pretty popular in K-12 is using deep freeze where various changes won't survive a reboot, but they, you know, from a student perspective, you get a chance to go through, see how it all works, make the changes. And, uh, but once it reboot, it goes back to however the system administrator wants it to be. And that's kind of a pretty happy medium um, in terms of functionality, whereas if you were, you know, the defense contractor or the web retailer, you might want a really locked down desktop with limited access to, to things, particularly the web retailer. You might want only access to point of sale kind of stuff for the vast number of your employees or uh, inventory management if they're, you know, working in the warehouse. Um, so, um, so the, the templates do need to be edited. You don't need to change everything in the templates, but you will need to change some things and you'll really need to reflect on the environment that you've selected to say, okay, um, you know, like, so a K-12 institution saying we're going to you know, any breaches, we're going to prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. Well, that's great to say that, but you have the resources to make that happen. You know, cyber crimes units by the state police are overloaded. You know, if you're a defense contractor, you're going to probably report, you might report some of this to the authorities, but some, a lot of the investigation you're going to do in-house. And you may even take action on um, someone who's done taken unpleasant action on you without going through the authorities, particularly if it's uh, originated from a foreign country. So um, as, you, as you think through you know, your scenario, you, you have to be realistic. And uh, you can't you know, say, well, we're going to put the strictest policy that we can out there and we're a K-12 institution because the reality is you can't enforce it. You don't, you will not have the money or the person power, you know, whereas if you are the defense contractor, you certainly have the money and you most likely have the person power. And, uh, uh, yeah. So you should read a chapter a week. I saw that. I just saw that flash by, um, and, and the, the templates generally should be, you know, the quiz templates, should generally be aligning to the chapter that you're on. Um, you know, if we get bogged down, maybe we'll be a week behind, or if we're going really well, we maybe we'll be a week ahead. But the, the, the quiz templates will generally align to exactly to the topic of the chapter. And uh, there's no need to read a chapter the week of the midterm. Um, you should just focus on preparing for the midterm. 
So the midterm will be a 50 question objective test. Um, oh, good question. Is there a due date? So the due date is supposed to be by um, the end of the, you know, the, when you look at things in Moodle, it says, you know, the week of, what's today, the 23rd, so we started on what, the 22nd? So it'll show the 22nd to the 29th. So ideally, you have your stuff completed by the 29th. So, you know, the, the end of the week that we're in. However, I, I tend to be flexible, especially if you're communicative with me. Um, so, you know, this isn't residential college. This is community college. And many of you have families, have jobs, you're working full time, uh, maybe taking a couple of classes, you're juggling a whole lot of balls, and sometimes life happens and a ball drops. So if, uh, if you don't get your stuff in um, by um, Tuesday of next week, I'm not going to take you to task. I'm not going to be extremely worried about it, but if there is something going on, I do appreciate it if you just drop me a note and I don't need the details. You can say, you know, stuff has happened in life and I, I'm just not going to get my assignments done. You know, I'm going to be late and, and I'm cool with that. If, however, you know, weeks go by, <laughs> And I haven't heard from you, um, and you haven't been posting. Uh, I don't feel very sympathetic. Uh, authentication failed, yay, because I was talking and typing at the same time. So, yeah, if you're communicative with me, it's all good. And, and uh, you know, as I said, people run into roadblocks, and uh, and I'll do my best to to accommodate. Uh, you know, I, for you know, and I have things that you know happen in my life. So the week that we're doing the exam, I'll set up the exam so that you can do more than one attempt. But the first one completed is the grade. So, but the it'll be set up so that if Sometimes, you know, you're doing the exam and it freezes or something and and you need me to reset it. But I'm going to uh, be out of town the week of the final exam. And my access to the Internet is going to be pretty limited that week. So um, I'll have it set up so that you can have multiple attempts. And if there's something weird going on for you. And you're like, I just can't get this done. You know, just drop me a note. And when I, as soon as I'm back, we'll deal with it. And, um, you know, if it winds up that you, because you had this glitch or whatever, and you can't finish it until the same week as the project presentations, that's fine. I just, I would rather have the exam done in the week that it's offered just because you need to focus on your project presentation if you're trying to do both at the same time. That's hard. So, um, any other questions? Um, what is the best way to get a hold of you? Email is really good. Yeah, so you shoot me an email. I try to respond within 24 hours, uh, and usually I can do that. Uh, I know that there's a couple of times during the course of the course that I have a lot going on. One of them is when I'm going to be out of town that week. Um, the other is the week um, that ends March, you know, not not talking Moodle dates, but the week that ends on Saturday, March 23rd. I have a really busy week that week, and I'll be pretty crazy and not doing a lot in Moodle between uh, Sunday night and um, Saturday afternoon, the 23rd. If I can check in, I will. Um, but that's a 
time in my job where I'm going to be putting in uh, 12 to 14 hour days. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in Moodle that week. And uh, I'll, you know, I'll address questions probably, you know, Saturday night or Sunday, uh, the, either Saturday night, the 23rd or Sunday, the 24th. Um, but email's really good. As I said, I try to respond within 24 hours. Um, if you have something come up and you feel like you need a Zoom conference, we can always set up a one-on-one. -on -one. So if you're running into a roadblock, you know, occasionally people have weird things going on with virtual machines. You know, they, they can be different depending upon the hardware. And the nice thing is that if you're running into that, and you you can share your screen, and I can actually request um, the uh, the the uh, request to control your screen, so that if I like, I think I see the problem, but it, rather than trying to tell you point and click here, if I walk through it and do it, and you see sometimes that's really efficient. So we can always, you know, you can shoot me an email, and we can do a Zoom thing if we really need to talk. Um, now, I use the free version of Zoom, so conference calls are typically limited to 40 minutes. We were fortunate that tonight, you know, it flashed up and said, I had this, we had this free one and it could go as long as we wanted. Uh, and that's kind of nice for the first night. Um, when it's with a free one, a point to point call, so just between two people, that's unlimited. We can go as long as we need to. Uh, but the group sessions are typically 40 minutes. So I'll try to limit what we do in the group sessions to 40 minutes. And uh, the way it's going to work, and I'm going to post the schedule. Um, so we have Wednesday night tonight. I'm teaching two online classes right now. And so on sun this coming Sunday, it'll be online for my other class. And then next week on Wednesday, it'll be online for my other class. And then a week from Sunday, it'll be you guys. So you'll, it'll go like Sunday night, the end, which is kind of the end of the week, um, you know, of the assignments. And then Wednesday night, which is just after the, the new week has started. So you're kind of going to go Sunday, Wednesday, have a little break. And then Sunday, Wednesday, have a little break. But I'll, I'll, I'll post that so that you know when they are. And again, there may be um, a week in there where it just doesn't fit into my life at all. And I'll say, you know, there won't be a Zoom conference on Sunday or Wednesday. But if anybody really is, you know, desperate, we can always set up a one on one. And especially, you know, when we have that gap. When, when it's a long Wednesday to sun, Sunday, if you needed something in the middle of the week next week, you know, you could always shoot me an email if you're desperate and say, can we conference before that coming Sunday? And, you know, we can do that. And yes, the 7.30 will be the start time for both Sunday night and um, Wednesday night. The only thing that might vary that is if I had something come up for a Sunday night, I might offer it in the afternoon. Uh, but generally speaking, um, evenings are better for most people. Uh, so, which is why I do it in the evening. Uh, any other questions? Um, I see I, a hand raised. Yeah, that's me. Um, the, the invite that you sent the link to for these meetings it yep. had a repeat set for every 14 days. So that's not correct. Right. That is correct. Okay. So. so so this is every 14 days. Okay. And then the Wednesday is every 14 days. So do I have to make it to the to the to both of them? You do not. Okay. I, I just want people to check in like twice a month. Okay. So what I find is, you know, if it's all I hate it when I have people like, not this past semester. This past semester was great. Lots of people took advantage of the conference. But in the spring semester last year, very few people took advantage of the conference. And they weren't reading my notes and emails. And then I was having people say, you didn't tell us how to do this. You didn't have us tell us to do that. And they were writing to their coordinator. And I would be like, look, I wrote that. 
If you look in the announcements section, I had that emailed out to you on this date. And they weren't reading any communication from me and they weren't using the conference. And then they were saying I wasn't being communicative. And I'm like, I'm bending over backwards trying to be communicative, but you're not doing anything. It was really frustrating. And uh, so by last semester, the group that I had was great. Uh, they, you know, people were checking in regularly. Um, and so, you know, I find it can just be easier to answer questions sometimes in a format like this than um, trying to exchange emails. Some things are just complicated to explain in writing. You know, especially when I if I can share my screen and say, oh, yeah, this is this is what you do and you can see it and be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, that could be, you know, a three minute explanation. It might be a 20 minute email that I write that maybe I missed something that I assumed was obvious that isn't. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just is I just want people to check in twice a month through the conference. And if, you know, if you can't make it to either Sunday night or Wednesday night, I'm, I'm happy to set up a one-on-one. -on -one. It, 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 you know, it's all good. Um, it's just a little trickier for me because I'm teaching two classes and I'm running two conferences every week. I don't want to regularly, you know, standard schedule a third or fourth conference. Uh, I think my family might uh, disown me. <laughs> so any other questions? All right. If, uh, if everybody's good, I think we can call it a night and, you know, if there's anything that's not clear, um, you know,